why did I want to do a live event for New Year's Eve? Um, I definitely am in tune with the heightened degree of suffering that's going on out there due to the circumstances of our world. Because I receive emails and I do sessions with people where all this stuff is coming up. Um, COVID and the other things that have happened here in the United States have certainly turned our world upside down in a way. And I'm working with people every day who are affected by this. Like in different ways, people are coming to our treatment center because they're all cooped up for long periods of time and the old habits start to resurface, the trauma starts to come up, the anxiety or depression, the loneliness for those who are alone. Just the feeling of, of being <laughs> stuck or trapped in one place for long periods of time really does bring people's stuff up. And so I'm just in tune to, at least in my world, so many people have talked to me about this. And so I thought, what a, what a great thing is just at the end of 2020, if we just get together, however many of us, and connect. So one of the ideas I had was let's do a Zoom call because that way we could interact more. And that would be my favorite way of doing it for sure. But that didn't work out. So we're just gonna do a, a live event, which isn't as interesting because I don't get to see and feel everybody here. The most I can do is ask, uh, if you feel like it, to interact with me, like to ask questions or make comments so that we have some sort of conversation. Otherwise, I'm just gonna be here talking. Um, I wanna start with, you know, I've, I've seen a shift in a way in people where it's like a few years ago or even last year, uh, people were really focused on awakening and inquiry and then 2020 came and certain people are still definitely focused on that, but there's a focus on survival now. I think we all know that. Whether that be financial survival or physical survival with the, with the uh, virus or whatever it is, I think that's what people are focused on more than anything else. And so I was just sitting with that for a while. Um, and I thought, this is the perfect name for this, for this live event is to come back home to your true nature. Because when our, in, our survival instincts are prompted up by circumstances in the world, and we go into fight or flight, fight, flight, or freeze mode as a result of the feeling as if we're not going to survive, like food insecurity or can't pay the bills or I'm sick. I'm dying. Relatives are dying. And I can't see them. I can't visit them as they're dying. This brings up really basic needs that we have. If you follow Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's like we need first food, <laughs> water, shelter, and whatever else as a baseline before we can start getting into things like <laughs> self-realization or self-actualization, other, other higher levels. Um, and I get that. We have to. I mean, we have to have a roof over our heads. We need medicine when we're sick. We need help to survive. But as I sit with that, I realize that I've had a different experience of 2020 than so many people. I mean, I've been watching the news. I see what's going on, apparently, in the world. But at the same time, for three years, I've had really, really bad nerve pain, chronic nerve pain in my spine. And so I had a different experience of 2020. I, I see on TV, people will say, oh, 2020 is the year we'll, we will all want to forget or we'll think it's the worst year ever. And it's been bad, but something really good happened in 2020. Actually, many good things happened in my own world. But the biggest thing that happened is that the chronic nerve pain went away or it just became a very light sensation in my spine and that's the greatest gift but I, I sort of learned or unlearned so much through that process because it felt like survival I'm telling you it felt like survival um, 
in much of the way that people are dealing with survival instincts right now, I was dealing with it in a different way. I'm going to try to be completely transparent here. The pain was so bad. And at first, my body was and my mind was rejecting any sort of medications. And so as it rejected those medications, the nerve pain would just be there and would amp up. And because I'd had a history of addiction to medications, my mind was saying, no, don't go there. Do not do that. At the same time, the pain was ramping up. If you've ever had nerve pain, it's incredibly different than any kind of other pain. Um, it's like an energy that radiates for me throughout my body. And it started here. It starts here in T11 and 12 when it was activated. You can't really see. T11 and 12 is like mid-spine. So it's like having this epicenter or hypocenter in the spine that just radiates nerve energy everywhere. I had an abnormality in my spine. And as I was refusing medication, I came to suicidal ideation. Now people would say, Scott, you're a, a non-dual teacher. You're liberated or whatever. Why would that happen? It's very simple. I wasn't depressed. I wasn't, didn't have anxiety disorder. I wasn't freaking out about the past or the future. A simple thing, thing happened that brought up survival and death, which was I was refusing to take care of this pain. <laughs> and in refusing to take medication, it got to a level where the brain had no other option. And it just said, well, kill yourself. Just kill the body and mind. Get reborn in another life and do this again. And literally those thoughts were coming through. But the great thing about inquiry is that immediately, or close to, as soon as it came up, because it was really strong at first, because again, I was cutting out all of my options to take care of some really serious pain. When it first came up, it was very strong. But then when I looked at it, the suicidal ideation fell away. Which is one of the great things about inquiry for anybody out there who's experiencing suicidal ideation now. Suicide's way up during COVID. These inquiries, the Killaby inquiries, are so easily can dismantle that. And they did for me. And then when they did, I also dismantled my recovery story, which kept me from taking medication. And I took medication. And that helped tremendously. And then my body, through the process of inquiry, let go of those medications one by one. And I got back to my natural state, and which means no medication. And the medication was perfect. It was absolutely perfect to help me get through a period. And then it wasn't needed anymore. The body said no. It wasn't even the mind. So the body just let go of it. I want to talk about that later. So I never got into the addiction cycle, which was amazing. But the body... When it started to say no, all of these, there, there then became this inquiry around the spine pain, uh, coming into the body, the somatic experience, and using skillful inquiry to work with resistance within that pain and to work with stress. So I started to use the spine pain as like a stress detector, because I know from my direct experience and from science that stress is very much related to or creating or exacerbating uh, physical pain and illness. So I went into inquiry around that, and I just used that pain as a stress indicator. And I looked at all of the things and the people in the world that could possibly be creating stress that I couldn't see, maybe stress that was unconscious, and I began to see it. It was very, very <laughs> unconscious. I had to go very, very quiet to see it and ask the right questions. And when I did, I went all the way back to childhood and anger, hatred came up for the conditioning that we all experience as children. I felt the anger just, <sighs> just <clears throat> like a beast. I felt like a beast, an animal who was releasing Sing energy. And as I did, somehow something in that and in the skillful inquiry, made the pain go away. But I've been in survival mode to some degree for three years. 
with this pain. So COVID wasn't really much more of a survival issue for me. While everyone else is dealing with survival this year, I'm like, hey, welcome aboard the survival train. I've been on it for two years. <laughs> so I've had a different experience of COVID, but I can have such compassion for those people who are dealing with that in some shape or form, the feeling of like, I'm not gonna survive, or I'm gonna die, or I have no options. That's what happens sometimes, like, what am I gonna do? I have such compassion for that because I've been going through it in a way, in a different way with the spine pain, completely different in a way than COVID and all of the things that you're seeing in the world. So I, my heart is here for you. For those of you who have our in survival mode. <laughs> my heart is just, mm, this is why I'm doing this talk. Like, I just want to connect with everyone out there and, and say to you, I feel that, I know that. And through this together, we can survive. And more than that, we can deepen. With inquiry and with awareness, there's no end to the depth of this freedom that we call awakening or whatever we call it. And that's been reinforced in such a beautiful way through the process of having the spine pain and having it go away or be healed is the deepening <sighs> is amazing. Um, people say, well, what do you mean by deepening? Well, when you experience it, you'll know it and you won't have questions about it anymore. You can't measure it like the mind can't really measure deepening. Um, deepening is a settling into your direct experience even more and going into those places that are dark or scary or painful and bravely going in with skillful inquiry to see what is causing that suffering and to let that suffering dissolve. That's the deepening. And you can't measure it with the mind. You can only experience it. And then I call it something like deepening, but truly there's no words for it. You'll know it as it happens. You know, the world, if, if those of you who are suffering right now because of what's going on in the world, because of personal circumstances, financial, health, whatever it is, food, anything, you know, there's a tendency then to disregard these kind of teachings, the non-dual teachings or inquiry, because that's for people who have the luxury of having their basic needs met. I don't think that's the right way of looking at this. Um, I know that instinctually we go to try to get our basic needs met first. That's what Maslow said. But in the midst of that, if we can bring awareness and inquiry to that, to the survival mode that we get in, there's a deepening that can happen for all of us. Because life itself is about survival. You know, science has actually said now that addiction really is just survival. It's the survival mechanism gone awry. Life isn't in some way just survival. So you can use the survival instinct that comes up and the feeling of threat that comes up to deepen. With rest, resting in presence, and inquiry. Like the world is your teacher. More than I am or any other individual apparent person, this world is really our teacher. And this is what I've seen in the last few years of my own experience. It's like a perfect matrix. Because this matrix of the world, we'll talk more about, although it causes a great degree of suffering for many people, it's actually the catalyst or it's the doorway into freedom. The way that we're seeing the world, that world is not real. But we can't see it until we look. Let's talk about that for a second. When I was living in the ego state, and I did not know this at the time, I could not speak of this at the time, because I was unconscious, so to speak. But it seemed as if the world was just as it was, like my thoughts were just presenting reality exactly as it was. 
and that there's this world of separate people and separate things and it's all objective out there. I had no sense that my mind was creating that. I thought it was all real and I suffered because of it. And then when the awakening happened, it was clearly seen. <laughs> you can't even express it really, that none of that is real. None of it. Um, as I began to watch thoughts, that's the thing. I went from being in the ego state where you're just thinking thoughts and each thought seems to present reality as it is. Like you think, well, she's this way and the government is this and this is this way and I hate this and you're right and I'm wrong, whatever, I'm right, you're wrong. All this stuff. We really think it's real and we suffer. The beautiful thing is once you see what's going on, there's a way out of that suffering. Let me show you. You have to step back in a way and rest as awareness and look and see that what you're actually experiencing are thoughts. And those thoughts make it appear as if they're pointing to separate things out there, right? But they're not. They're actually just thoughts. And when you look at those thoughts, any one of them, and a thought, for example, falls away, the experience of that thing that the thought was pointing to as a separate thing doesn't feel separate anymore. And I noticed that really early on when I began witnessing thoughts. I saw that. And it was almost like, just to use like loose words, it's like, there's just like this data right here. Data, words and pictures, images and words, either words that you see or that you hear, and pictures, images. And that's all data in front of us, and yet we're not awake to it. And so, meaning we're not aware of that data stream right there, words and pictures. And so when we're not aware of it, we actually believe it. That programming is believed and belief presents itself as reality. If we believe something in the mind, we believe that it exists out there in reality as its own thing, like it's real. But once you step back and just rest as awareness and see this data coming up, and what I would do is just look at one piece of data at a time because you, it, the entire realm of data is too overwhelming, you know? I noticed that the world that I was seeing was actually being created by these words and pictures, but I couldn't look at all of them at once because it felt too overwhelming. So I just started looking at the ones that seemed the most real or the most true. I don't know, instinctually it felt like I should go there. And I would just look at like one thought at a time again just watch it fall and as it fell there would just be this, this for a moment an experience of presence it might be just really brief sometimes just a split second back then or a few seconds and then the thinking mind would come up and then there would be a believing it and then again the world feels real out there and the suffering and everything in here feels real but again I would come back and look from awareness more at these thoughts each one was none of them could stand the light of awareness not a single thought when it was looked at gently from awareness could survive in that they all would fall away as I would watch them usually one by one you can't actually see a lot of times you can't see more than one thought sometimes you can the point being is that the awakening, the initial awakening was when that wall of conceptualization, that data right there, whew, fell away completely. It just wasn't there anymore. And so the experience of the world as being out there and separate fell away. And I remember looking at everything and saying, oh, I, I'm that. I'm that. I'm everything. And I think it was Nisargadatta who said, Wisdom is knowing that I'm nothing, and love is knowing that I'm everything. And that boggles the mind. Mind cannot understand that one. 
but through the years that has been such a beautiful way of putting it wisdom is knowing that i'm nothing how can i know that well by looking and seeing that these thoughts this data just falls away and when it does the experience of a world of separate people falls away each time the data stream or something in the data stream falls away and then when it all falls away it's like there is no self there's no other and i am everything because the separation isn't there anymore the mind is where the separation is in direct experience it's not here meaning in presence just being present that wasn't the end of it though because um an even more beautiful insight is to see that even when thoughts would arise again within awareness um they would give the 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 apparent picture of something out there that's real but there was a saying that it's not it's actually just a thought but there was like oh that's fine now cuz i can see it for what it is and then thought came back in and i realized oh that's just a play and i am still everything like even the thoughts are an expression of this which is beautiful and completely paradoxical the mind can't understand it that even the thoughts are this meaning even the thoughts once they arose in awareness and that seeing happened there was no problem with thinking which brings me to my next subject which is evolution some of you won't resonate with this but i picked up ken wilbur's book years ago called integral spirituality <laughs> and the first time i picked it up i literally had it in my hands started reading it it was so wordy and conceptual i shut the book and i put it away for a long time it just seemed like he was too heady for me but i knew that there was something in there that i wanted to read and when i read about it read that book it was it really changed things for me because he talked about the evolution of consciousness which I want to talk about right now and for some people that doesn't even make sense consciousness is evolving well let's talk about that for a second from awareness there's no evolution if you're just present here in the moment what is evolution it's a concept But if you dig a little bit deeper, you'll notice that our consciousness is evolving. Now Ken says it much more articulately than I do. But we have evolved from like very, we'll say it this way. We're moving or evolving from ego-centric thinking, like me-centered thinking, and then into like group-centered thinking, like ethnocentric thinking, like my nation, my group, my tribe. to universal consciousness it's like evolving but in a different way to say it is like at some point in my life i think i was a fundamentalist like not a fundamentalist christian but had fundamentalist tendencies i think we all go through that in some way but then we all kind of move out of it or many of us do and if you look at the history of humanity actually you can see the evolution science didn't even come in until a certain point in our history and when science came in it changed religion and religion and science have been kind of at war because they don't agree with each other science talks about evolution measuring everything dirt <laughs> everything and then religion says something else about reality right these two things were at war with each other but science was an evolution it was an evolutionary um advancement for us and yet that wasn't the end and it isn't the end of our evolution of consciousness because now we know that science is here and it's like a tool when you really believe that science is the the final answer to everything you're at that level of consciousness just like you can be at the level below that where you think that your religion is the reality again science comes in sort of transcends that um because it's measuring everything 
So we evolved past that, and people are at different phases in that development, but we move beyond science. We transcend that. We include it. It's a tool, but it's not reality. It's just another framework or way of looking at the world. We go into higher states, different states of consciousness after that. And I remember, and Ken talks about this, the phase of development that's above science is what he calls mean green or green, which is uh, equality, liberal. And you can see that division in our politics right now. In some sense, the liberal side of things is talking about equality, social unrest, Black Lives Matter, Me Too. Those, those kinds of viewpoints are in that consciousness, right? And <laughs> that liberal side is often fighting with the more conservative side, which is not always based in religion, but some of it is. And again, they're butting heads, right? Um, that's, we are evolving, if you'll notice. And this will be clear, I think, in years to come. We'll be able to look back and see it better now. Right now, we've got a pretty green world. Green meaning that stage of development where equality is really important, a level playing field is important, and all of the oppressed people, the downtrodden, the minorities, are having a voice and speaking up. Now, the reason this is important to me is because in the 90s, having grown up gay, I became an activist, a liberal green. That was my green phase of development. I, Science was in my life and included, but beyond that, there was just another phase of development beyond that, where I moved into that way of thinking and I was an activist in some way. I mean, I wasn't out there marching in the street like gay rights, but I did my fair share of activism and angry kind of liberal um, fighting of the powers that be, the homophobic powers that be. That was actually, there was suffering on that phase of development and that level of development because you actually think of yourself as a victim. And I know, and I see the downtrodden, I see the people, whether they're black or transgender or gay or whatever, historically, you have been treated awfully by humans, by our own species. We have pushed these groups down and made them feel oppressed. And of course, that's not going to work as we evolve. You can't do that. The evolution of our consciousness is going to see that that's not, that's not how we're going to do things. We don't do that to each other. And we're evolving to understand in the green level that we don't do that to each other. This is what you're seeing right now in the world when you see Black Lives Matter, when you see the gay rights thing or the women's rights thing. It's all those those folks who have felt like victims of the patriarchy or the powers that be, they are in that stage where they are demanding equality. That's a phase of development. That isn't, hasn't even been around since like the 60s. If you look at history, before that we didn't really have a lot of that thinking. Our consciousness is changing. But we just can't see it because we're so close to it. It's right here, we can't see it until we do, until we wake up out of some of this. So in the 90s, in that green phase, when I got into the non-dual world and started to do inquiry and awareness was there, um, I moved out of that green phase. And one of the ways of moving out of it is I had to really look at the victim consciousness in that. Because as a, when I really strongly identified myself as a gay man, and I am gay, I am gay, on the level of form, I'm gay. But that's, I really felt that as my identity in the 90s and before. And when you feel that way, there's a sense because you've been oppressed, it's like, I'm a victim. And as a victim, I have a deficiency story. Like, there's something wrong with me. Like, I'm not good enough. Or I'm not accepted. I'm not loved. As a gay man, as a black woman, as a woman, whatever. And there's suffering in that. You see? They're suffering in it because there's a victim consciousness. Now it's a necessary thing. Like we're in this phase where that victim consciousness has to speak in order to help change the consciousness here on earth. 
it's it's necessary to have these protests for that phase of development but we can move beyond that too that's a necessary phase but consciousness is moving beyond that also and we're going to see that in years to come right now we're in this green phase because it's necessary for this phase to be here to equalize things that have historically <laughs> caused suffering for people above that is when you get into what we call integral um, integral consciousness what is integral consciousness it's very hard to explain but at some point you see it's not even about equality in integral consciousness you start to see that you're wrong but only about everything <laughs> or at best you're partially right when you're thinking about something and so you leave behind the idea and all the ideas that you believed before thinking that you're right about everything whether you're right at the green phase like i'm right about my activism or i'm right about science or i'm right about my religion all that is gone it's gone the right versus wrong thinking is gone at integral consciousness. Integral just means hmm. knowing that all of these perspectives in the world are included now. Transcended and included at the same time. It's almost like not being at war anymore with anything or anyone and understanding that everybody has a place at the table and instead of right versus wrong we're just all contributing to this whole this wholeness of life and that's kind of the way of integrated thinking partial perspectives have been one of the biggest problems on earth partial perspectives like my religion is the is the reality or science is the answer <laughs> or non-duality is the answer whatever partial thinking is divisive because it mistakes it mistakes its thoughts for reality you see that and so it has just a partial viewpoint and yet it believes it's the, the absolute reality and that kind of thinking is why we're at war with each other on earth we're fighting each other because we each think we have the right perspective and as you move beyond that you don't even think that way anymore and that's what I'm pointing to. That it's not just that we wake up to presence. That's certainly a big key to this. But there's another thing happening if you look and that there's there's an evolution happening, not just the evolution of physical forms. Look at what we've developed, look at what how forms have developed beautifully on this earth, but consciousness itself is changing and developing and moving beyond old ways of thinking. Right? Who knows where that's going to go? but it's a beautiful experiment or exploration. And there's no way <laughs> that we can truly get rid of the division in the world until we evolve out of that right versus wrong thinking and these perspectives which take themselves to be ultimate reality. Like as long as these perspectives, whatever your perspective is, if you think you're right, look, the world's gonna be fighting for many, many years to come until we evolve out of it. And you can't really evolve out of it until you evolve out of it. And inquiry is super helpful for that. I'll just tell you, um, I have actually talked to Ken Wilber. He said that inquiry and meditation are like the tools through which we evolve past old ways of thinking and move into new ways of new perspectives. So inquiry is a tool that we have, the killer bee inquiries, that it certainly helps that happen I hope some of that resonates I'm speaking from my experience um, I, I grok this <laughs> very deeply but at the same time I'm not holding on to it as the ultimate reality I'm not fighting you I don't have that dog in the fight the dog in the fight anymore with that integrated consciousness there's there's just no fight anymore And that's beautiful and that's peaceful and that's inclusive but it isn't really looking for equality 
um, Kim calls the green level flat land because we're just trying to equalize everything. But that's not really, that's just another perspective. perspective. That's all that is, is another conceptualization. And we do move beyond that, actually. Interesting stuff. Let's talk about another thing in terms of evolution. Just consider this for a second. Humans are different than other mammals. I've got two dogs here. They're so beautiful and sweet and loving. Um, but they don't think like we do. They do not seem to conceptualize like we do. They seem to have the nervous system, the emotional thing that we have and that's why we have pets I think is because that unconditional love we feel on that level the love but they don't think like we do so there's an evolution apparently happening within the form here that we as humans can think and conceptualize and I think that conceptualization has been like really important for our evolution because it has allowed us to create for example RVs I live in an RV Someone had to conceptualize this for it to happen. Someone had to conceptualize everything that you see in your life. It started with conceptualizing, being able to think about something, using the mind and then creating things. All these beautiful things, TVs, everything that you see, heaters, um, computers. Conceptualization is a great tool uh, that humanity has that apparently the other forms of evolution below us do not seem to have. And at the same time, what happened with us is it seems like the conceptualization took us over. The mind took our experience over. So it was a great tool. We're, we've, been, we've been given this tool of conceptualization and then it just whoo, takes over everything and piles itself up and so that we're so stuck in the conceptualization, the ego, that we can't see, we can't, we don't know presence anymore. We've lost it. What is presence? Huh. It's just the experience of being mm. here now. The simple experience it's of being here now. And there is a peace here that passes all understanding because being here now in some sense <laughs> requires the conceptualization to either be very light or for it to fall away or not to be piled on like it was so rediscovering like the innocence that we've 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 lost is what I'm referring to. The innocence is just this presence, this innocence, innocent presence that we see in our animals when they're just really present to us. They're there, wagging their tails, licking us, just right here, right now, in the moment. Not thinking about the past or future. Just here. We've all, as a species, have lost that because the conceptualization, as much as it was helpful, to create all these wonderful things that we have, medicine, science, everything. Um, we relied on it so much that we lost connection with our, the experience of what, what I'm calling our true nature. Coming back home to our true nature is coming back home to recognize the presence here that is in some sense prior to all of that thinking. Prior is the best word I can put on it. Now, going back to Nisargadatta, who said, wisdom is knowing that I'm nothing, and love is knowing that I'm everything. When that conceptualization is piled on like that, where we're thinking and processing life almost completely through the mind, we have to do inquiry and rest as awareness to see that none of that is actually out there. It's actually just that data that's appearing here that I talked about. And when that data falls away, there's the experience of no self. Because in presence, there's no thinking, like in pure presence. My mind is quiet. It's 
not labeling anything. Right? So the wisdom... I'm seeing... I'm nothing. And that there is nothing. Here. Just a bunch of thinking. Ultimately. And then love is saying that I'm everything. Right? I'm everything. Which means there's no separation. That cannot be understood by the mind. That has to be experienced. We talk about ego in therapy and also in non-duality. Ego is that sense of me. The separate me. Now, if you've been in the non-dual world for a while, you know, at least intellectually, and maybe even in your own experience, that there really isn't an ego. There's no self. <laughs> That's actually just part of the data. The mind comes up and thinks and puts thoughts, words, and pictures that seem to refer to a self. But yet the awareness here sees those. The awareness is not a self. It's not a person. It's just awareness. Seeing these thoughts. And then you start to see that's all that's happening. It's just a pattern of thoughts, words and pictures. And there's no self in any of that. There's really, really just words and pictures in your mind. But you can't know this intellectually. You literally have to stop and look. Throughout the day, really moment by moment, or as often as you can to see what's happening. So we have this pattern again of data coming across and there's no self there. Now, when you start to be, when you, when you start to inquire into the experience of a self, which is where all the suffering is. Mm -hmm. I heard a quote, it's famous by now, that something like 99% of our suffering has to do with a self and there isn't one <laughs> there's truth in that for sure because once you see that there's really no self there's just these thoughts arising one two three four and they fall away and then it comes more <laughs> you don't find a self you just see the pattern of thoughts and those thoughts are often connected to feelings and sensations in the body and these feelings and sensations are what make the thoughts feel true. And this is something I discovered in my own experience and brought into this work. Because the, there's a mind-body connection that we're starting to come back to know again in our consciousness. Because, well, I won't go into why we have it, but there's a mind-body connection here, which I call the, the Velcro effect. And that just means that these words and pictures are not happening in a vacuum. They're happening and they're connected to, Velcro to, feelings or sensations in what we call the body. So if I have a thought that's angry, or an angry type thought, and I feel the anger, then that thought feels really true. So if I'm angry at my friend, there's a thought about my friend or thoughts about my friend, and there's this anger that comes up, and everything that I'm experiencing feels true, and I think I'm right, and I'm going to attack my friend because I'm angry. Lots going on there. You have to pull back and see what's going on. You have to see that you believe something, not just because these thoughts are coming through, because there's a feeling there that's Velcroed or stuck to those thoughts that makes those thoughts feel true. Whether that feeling is anger or sadness or shame or whatever, or some sensation, as long as it's connected to the thoughts, the thoughts feel true. This is a big reason why we're fighting each other, is we, we don't see this. Like, we're mistaking this for reality. We're not seeing that the reason that we believe our thoughts really is because of what we're feeling when we're thinking those thoughts. Even if it's a subtle feeling. So our inquiries undo that Velcro effect to show you that there's a connection there. And then through the inquiries, as that connection is broken, um, as the thoughts come back through, they're not stuck to those feelings anymore. So for example, when we do trauma work with people, which trauma comes up when you're sitting in awareness, um, at first when the trauma comes up, it's like, 
would say something like, uh, being beaten up when you're a kid. When it comes through in an inquiry session, it feels almost re-traumatizing because there's so, there's so much Velcro with it. We may even be resistant to look at it being beaten up because it's scary, the memories of it. But when you turn towards it with awareness and see that data, which again are just memories in the form of pictures of what happened, getting beaten up, and words that go with it, there's a strong feeling there or sensation there with it that comes up with trauma. It's a really good example of the Velcro effect right there. It's a very strong Velcro with trauma. And so what we've learned with the inquiries is that you can't ignore trauma. Here's another thing. You can't ignore this in awakening because it won't ignore you. You could try to bypass it. It won't work. It'll come back. It'll, it'll almost force you to look at it. And this is the crazy thing about this. And when I look at like the Eastern teachings that never mention trauma, and it's not even their fault because trauma is a word or discovery, I think mostly from the Western world. It wasn't really in the Eastern teachings. So when you read Buddhism or you read about Buddhism, you read about Advaita Vedanta or Hinduism, you don't really hear the, the word trauma. You don't really hear, you might hear other words that kind of point to that. But the word trauma, I think came from the West. And I think it really pinpointed something about our experience that wasn't being pinpointed very clearly in the Eastern teachings. Once we, we have this word trauma, then we can point to the fact that part of our conditioning involves these traumatic experiences that have happened to us that have left imprints in our system. We're carrying that trauma around in our bodies. What happened? So the Eastern teachings say, let's just wake up. Wake up out of, the, of this. You're not actually the ego. But sometimes they miss the fact that there's early childhood development trauma that makes it difficult for people to experience this awakeness because that trauma keeps pulling them back into a trigger or a fight, flight, freeze state, or whatever it is. They get re-traumatized or re-triggered because the trauma is being avoided or it's not being seen in awareness. So what we've done with the Killaby inquiries is we've included that. We've included the developments of Western science. Again, transcend and include, include. Include these insights from science, the studies. When I was, when we were opening our two treatment centers, amazing things happened with that that I just want to talk about now because I've never talked about any of this really publicly. When we first opened the center, we were the first mindfulness, non-dual, inquiry-based treatment center in the country. So we were breaking new ground. And I had an intuitive sense that mindfulness uh, would become much more in the mainstream, but it just wasn't when we first opened. But I had a sense that it was coming and then it came. And you can now see it in, on social media, mindfulness, meditation. Even inquiry is much more in social media and much more in our popular culture now. So it was really cool to have started these centers based in mindfulness. And then now mindfulness is much more in our <laughs> consciousness. That whole thing is there. But what was really interesting is that as we brought these Eastern practices into recovery, Eastern practices meaning self-inquiry, meditation, and mindfulness, what we started to see was science was supporting what we were finding. So as clients came into our centers who were addicted to heroin or meth or something, we were seeing in their history trauma, trauma, trauma. And we started to intuitively know that this trauma is driving this addiction. Trauma often drives spiritual seeking, too. It's a driver. We were seeing it in our experience with people. And at the same time, science was coming out with studies in the last five years, 10 years, but mostly five years, saying trauma is behind, is 80% of addiction, or I should say it this way. Yeah, trauma is 80% of, of addiction. It's the driver of 80% of it. Science was coming out with all these scientific studies, and then they were matching what we were seeing in our direct experience with 
trauma in the assessment of people. So it was a very rich coming together of Western science and Eastern practices. Beautiful merging right there and reinforcing that we were on a good path. And then we started to develop what we call now the new model of recovery. And someone we'll talk about that now. You've seen some posts of mine and Dan McClintock's about the new model of recovery. And uh, many of you may not even know what it is. So I'll try to explain some of it tonight. But I invite you to go watch YouTube, my YouTube channel to see the different new model videos or join the Radical Recovery Summit, um, which is on killabycenter.com. Um, new model of recovery is talked about there. Now, how did that form? We didn't just make that up. We started to actually look at our own experience, not just the experience of our clients, but my own experience in recovery. Dan's experience in recovery. So what we call the old model is simply the conceptualization, the rules, the beliefs, the stories, the identities that we take on and that compound the addiction. They actually drive it um, because we really believe this stuff. And as we read, the more we, there's actually a scientific study that came out as we were seeing that, that said people who believe they're addicted are more likely to it behave addictively than those who do not believe they are addicted. Literally, the science was saying belief is a big part of why people are addicted. And we were seeing the same thing with clients at the centers. And we saw that as the old model. In other words, you believe certain things and what you believe becomes your reality. So if you believe you're an addict and you will, that will be your reality. The new model challenges all of that. It uses inquiry, skillful inquiry to dismantle all that because all of that is contributing to the addiction. It's pretty radical. Part of it is dismantling the addict identity. Because if you believe that you're an addict, on some level, you probably also believe that there, you're, there's something fundamentally wrong with you or missing. And we call those deficiency stories. So to really identify yourself as an addict, you have to really believe in that deficiency story on some level, that you're different or that you're sick, there's something wrong with you. And that conceptualization once you're in that, you live it because you believe it's reality. And we found, strangely, that even believing that you're an addict can be a driver towards addiction, just like the science was saying. We saw it. We saw it with heroin addicts at our center who would dismantle the addict identity and they would feel free. And they would feel less craving towards the heroin simply because they didn't believe in that paradigm anymore that I'm an addict. You would think if they let go of the identity, they would just go out of control with heroin. The opposite happened. Until they would go somewhere and someone would say, no, you're an addict. We had a girl who, who went somewhere to a meeting and someone said, you need to call yourself an addict. And she came back practically in tears. And she's like, I'm craving heroin right now because maybe I am an addict. And all that freedom that she was experiencing by dismantling that came back. I mean, that suffering came back in that moment. And we saw firsthand exactly what science was saying, which is that if you believe that, you will act that out. So part of the new model is dismantling these things. This new model was organically discovered um, it wasn't conceptualized as a theory at all and some people see it as a theory and Dan and I keep saying no this is actually our experience and if you can see that it's our experience then there's no argument with that everyone has a different experience Dan and I were both in for example the 12-step program and we took on a lot of beliefs in that and at a certain point, when the awakening started to happen for each of us, we woke up out of that. And when you wake up out of all of that, you can't go back, really. <laughs> You're falling down the rabbit hole of freedom, of liberation. You can't, can't go back and believe and have rules and all that 
stuff anymore. So this is experience. It isn't theory. But we still had to conceptualize our experience to talk about it. And, and in that way, we, we created what we call an iceberg. Or we, it is an iceberg. Um, just to show you what we mean by the new model of recovery. So an iceberg is like this, but only the surface, right? Just the tip of it is above the surface. The, the majority of the iceberg is underneath the water. But we can't see it. When we're on top of the water, we can only see the tip, right? We're missing all this stuff below. And that is a symbol for what we miss in terms of the drivers behind addiction. The things that drive addiction. We found in our experience, in our direct experience, not as a theory, but in our direct experience, we found that trauma is a driver. We found it in our own experience, in the experience of clients that we were assessing. Trauma is a driver. It's driving and it's underneath. We don't see it. It's unconscious. We don't often want to look at it, and yet it's driving the addiction. So we use these inquiry tools to turn towards this trauma and dismantle that. Welcome it, but dismantle it. Because if you don't, it will remain as a driver towards the addiction, whatever that is. And then we also saw, not as a theory, but as direct experience, that deficiency stories are drivers. This goes back to the story of the girl, for example, who at first believed that she was an addict, a heroin addict, and then therefore she believed that she was deficient. She's not good enough. There's something wrong with her. She's sick, whatever. And then that belief was driving the heroin use. She was in that reality, I'm an addict, and it just perpetuated the using. And then she got in recovery and someone said, now you're a recovering addict. She believed that and she got hooked into that reality. And then she came to us and we said, you're not either. That's not what you are. You're not an addict or a recovering addict. We couldn't tell her that or these people that they had to see it for themselves in their own experience. And once you see that you're not something, <laughs> once you really see it, you can't go back. But these drivers, one of the drivers is just how we, what we believe, what we believe drives us. So we started to see these beliefs were drivers, deficiency stories, not just the addict story, but any deficiency story, like I'm unlovable, I'm worthless, I'm not good enough. All that stuff that's held in the body too, driving us towards addiction, driving us towards spiritual seeking, driving us towards just being in our heads all the time, driving us towards validation, approval, seeking. Seeking love, attention, fame, money, all that driving was being done by these drivers under the iceberg. Trauma, deficiency stories, and then we saw shame. <laughs> shame. It's almost like it, you can't, it can't be an addiction without shame. Have you noticed? Because addiction is a behavior which, as society sees, stigmatizes it. And therefore, the person experiencing the addictive behavior feels shame and hides and, and lies. And we saw that so often at the treatment center. People would come in and they were so in that shame world that when they came to us and we were saying, just be open and honest with us. We're not going to shame you. And if we do, we're going to look at it with inquiry. They still lied to us because they were so used to living in that world of secrecy and hiding that they just tried to hide from us. So when they would relapse, guess what? At first they wouldn't tell us. And if they go to other treatment centers and they relapse, they would not tell the treatment center. They might tell their friends that they relapsed, but they were hiding in shame. We said, this is not the way to treat addiction. We have to deal with the shame. Because the shame, first of all, is driving secrecy. It's driving the lying and the deception. And how do you treat someone when they are lying to you about their condition? Like imagine if you, if someone had cancer, but they were trying to hide it from you, from the doctor. <laughs> how could the doctor treat that person? So we had to bring the shame topic fully on the table and look at it in inquiry. 
And when we did, in our own experience, we found something interesting, which was it's actually a driver towards addiction. I remember first seeing it in my own sexual compulsion. I was never a porn watcher, but being gay through Grindr had a sexual compulsion for three years. Um, and I, no I noticed in my experience that I felt shame around all that. And I didn't want to tell anybody. There was secrecy there. And that secret private world which reinforced itself actually drove the compulsion. It just kept it going. In fact, at one point I said, shame is an aphrodisiac. It really it is. It's driving us. We love to feel naughty. We love to feel shameful. That drives us towards that. And then we saw, oh, shame is a driver for all other addictions. It's driving us because we live in that world of shame. That's our reality. Whatever we believe and feel is our reality. And that shame, guess one of the great, <laughs> the easiest ways to take care of that, go use something. Cover it up. Don't have to feel it. So shame is a driver. All these things un under the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg, we saw other things too. Really any kind of emotional suffering is a driver. Chronic pain, which I've shared with you, can be a driver. Boredom can be a driver. So with the new model, we stopped focusing on behavior. Um, in the old model, I'm just using these as speaking terms, they focus a lot on behavior. In the sense, there's like, just stop behaving that way. If you just stop drinking, that's the point. Just be sober. Focusing on behavior. Well, we said, well, this behavior is happening because of the drivers. So we started focusing on the drivers. And we recognize that when you focus on the behavior, that's when the shaming happens. So if you focus on someone, whether someone's drinking or not, they're going to experience that often as being shamed and judged. And that's going to pull them into that secret lying world, which drives them into addiction more. Not focusing on behavior is the new model. Focusing on drivers. And what I've seen in my own experience is that I've looked at my own traumas and as those have fallen away, or gotten very light in my experience, where deficiency stories are gone, are very light, and shame is gone, or very light, guess what happens? <laughs> no addiction. This is why I was able to medicate my chronic nerve pain after having done this inquiry without becoming addicted to painkillers or benzodiazepines or ketamine or anything. My body, because I remember we store all these, a lot of these drivers in the body. This is a Western thing, a scientific thing, well, so to speak, that we now have books about trauma that say we have issues in our tissues, meaning this is in our body, emotional body, carrying trauma. Science will tell us that the emotional body is driving addiction. We're carrying all this in our body right here. So inquiry has to go into the body fully into the body with awareness asking skillful questions and using skillful means to literally let go of all that like let it just dissolve away but it takes skill it's not just awareness because if you bring awareness into the body you don't really know what to do with that and there's already resistance in the body right it's like, I don't want to feel that. I've been in my head all my life. I don't know what to do with this. So we had to develop ways of coming into the body in a way that reduced the resistance. Allowed us to bring our awareness all the way into the body and explore these different aspects of our somatic experience that are driving the addiction, driving the depression and anxiety, and almost all these behaviors. Again, was matching what science was saying. Beautiful merging of the Eastern and the Western. Western. That's the new model of recovery. Some people have um, mistakenly believed that the new model is about just go use whatever you want. It's not really what it's about. Um, it's hard to explain this, but what is helpful for one person is just simply not for another. <laughs> We've learned this. so. 
If you would have told me in my 20s when I was swallowing painkillers like candy, if you would have told me, if you would have given me permission, I probably would have just kept swallowing them because that level of consciousness, there's no awakeness in that. And so I just repeat the pattern. Oh, somebody's saying, give me permission. Okay, I'll just keep going. Can't give me permission at that level of consciousness. But at a different place, when someone's at a different place, when they have worked through a lot of stuff or they're doing a lot of inquiry, sometimes what happens is a relapse or a using. Don't even have to encourage it. It just happens. For example, you go back to the porn or whatever. What we found with the new model is when that happens, we can go and take inquiry and look at all the stories and beliefs and drivers that surround and drive that behavior, that relapse, that binge. It's like though that using became this fertile ground for us to really dismantle the drivers. So we stopped, you know, we're not encouraging people to use. We're just saying, if that happens, let's look at that because that can be very valuable. Not encouraging that, but if it happens, wow, let's go into inquiry around it and see what you're believing. See what traumas are driving it. See what shame is hooked into it. Unhook from all that. And that's different because in the old model, it's like if you relapse, oh, you fell off the wagon, come back on. We don't really talk like that because we're not focused on behavior. We're focused on the drivers that led to that relapse. So that relapse shows us, ah, oh, these drivers. We can inquire into that. That's the new model of recovery. And again, it's not a theory. It's actually my experience. It's Dan's experience. And it's the experience of those who are there in that level of consciousness, that place, that whatever that is. I say level, but it's just a word. I want to talk about the Killaby inquiries. Many people I can see that have followed my work through the years don't know what the Killaby inquiries are. And people come to sessions and they're still talking about the living inquiries or the inquiries that I've done. I did five years ago or ten years ago. They don't realize that I, through having these treatment centers, have developed, along with Dan McClintock and others, a completely different set of inquiries. Why? Why did we create these? We had to, out of necessity. Before, when I was working with people, these were people that were coming to me who had a background in meditation or mindfulness or non-duality. And I could take them into inquiry fairly easy. Because they had already had, they already cultivated the experience of awareness to some degree. And they were aware of inquiry. So it wasn't a hard sell. I could just take them into that. When we opened treatment centers, people were coming right off the street with no background in mindfulness or meditation or inquiry. Didn't even know what it was. And they were adverse to the 12-step program. They wouldn't go. They'd been there, done that. 10 times, 20 times, one guy had been to 28 12-step programs. So, these people coming off the street with no background in this, we had to simplify inquiry. We had to make it to where a third grader could do it. And that's what the Killaby inquiries are, is really simplified inquiry. And often when we do the Killaby inquiries with people in sessions, they'll say, God, that's liberating, and it can't be that simple. We're like, yes, it is. And we were forced to make it that simple because we were dealing with a different population of people. It didn't have a background in this. So the Achilles inquiries are simplified, but at the same time, we had to make them apply and dismantle the drivers. So we had quite a task there. We had to meet these people coming off the street with no background. We had to simplify the inquiries but these inquiries had to actually be effective on the drivers that were driving the spiritual seeking, the addiction, whatever, depression, anxiety. And so we came up with inquiries that were both simplified and more penetrative. And the beautiful merging of those two things became the Killaby inquiries. Again, out of necessity, not a theory, but out of experience working with people we had to develop this and came out organically. 
certainly the best tools that I've ever seen for myself. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Kill the Inquiries. I want to say one thing. <laughs> I've heard of people, people say, well, Scott, why do you put your name on the Inquiries? Because we've tried it the other way. Like years ago, we, we tried just putting living Inquiries, take my name out of it, you know, be the humble teacher, no, no self teacher. Um, let's call it something else. We called it, first we called it living realization, took my name out of it, but nobody connected it and it, nobody knew that it was my work. And so very few people would make the connection. And we called it living inquiries, same thing. At one point we called our work natural rest. And again, nobody connected it with the work that I had already put out in the world. They, they weren't making the connection. So we finally just called it Killaby Inquiries for the simple reason of making the connection that it's connected to my work. Just, it's really just name recognition. That's why we call it Killaby Inquiries. People say, well, you must have a big ego to call it your inquiries. That's not how it happened. <laughs> it's not how it happened at all. We tried it the other way. It didn't work. So what are the Killaby Inquiries? I think if Dan were here, Dan McClintock is the co-developer of this. I think he would say, because we've talked about it, is that when you're in awareness, just watching things arise, allowing them, allowing what comes, one thing you're not seeing is what whatever you can't see. What's unconscious. There are stories that are unconscious in your mind that you cannot see by just witnessing thoughts in meditation or inquiry. Because they're hidden. They're not available to you until you start asking the right question. So for example, if I have a picture of dad that comes up in my awareness, and I think that's just a thought of dad, and that there's, I think that there's no story to it because I can't see the stories connected to it because they're unconscious. So I might ask like, um, what does that picture of dad actually mean? And then it's like the words come out of it, the meaning, I can see the words now, they're conscious now. And as the words come out and I see those, that data falls away. Each of those set of words and then dad falls away. Right? So we're getting into what's not conscious there. And then we started to develop it a little bit more by using utility inquiry. I remember Dan coming to me with this. Um, so for example, if a belief comes up um, that, um, I'm going blank here. <laughs> Mine is not finding any triggers. I'm trying to find an example here of utility inquiry. Um, so if you have the belief, let's say a picture of your friend comes up who you've had a conflict with, and you have the belief, she's out to get me. So that's what appears to your awareness. So if you're just watching from awareness, that's all you're going to see. There's going to be things there that are unconscious that you can't see. And one of them is the utility behind that, meaning the payoff. What do I get out of believing that she's out to get me? And then it comes up, well, that's how I stay safe. That's how I protect myself. All these unconscious thoughts come out. And as that data comes out and you witness that, you're going deeper, more penetratively into your suffering and dismantling it so that there's freedom and peace. And whatever other words you wanna throw on that. So getting into what's not conscious. Another thing about the living inquiries is we started to do reverse inquiry, which is if I believe that I'm ugly, I believe that, and then I suffer because of that, we reverse that and say something like, I'm attractive. But we don't do it like, I always say this, we don't do it like Stuart Smalley for those of the who are probably over 40 and watch Saturday Night Live, where he would look in the mirror and he would say, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and gosh darn it, people love me. That's not what we mean by reverse inquiry when we say I'm attractive. We say that as a way to pull up what we were not seeing about the belief that we're ugly. It's not just the thought that we're ugly, there are other supporting thoughts with it like memories of being told that we're not attractive, we couldn't see, or words that are connected to that. And until we reverse that, we can't see it. For example, the reverse inquiry is like, 
I try to use this metaphor. If you see ground, the earth, there's worms everywhere, but you can't see them. They're underground. They're not conscious. When you put the worm food over those, over the earth, here come the worms. And suddenly there's worms everywhere, as you can see. It took the worm food to bring that up. Reverse inquiry is like that. So if I believe that I'm ugly, there's a bunch of hidden worms there. Hidden thoughts that support that belief unconsciously. Feelings and sensations also. So when I say I'm attractive, I just say that and I let the ego fight it. And the ego comes up and says, no, you're not. And gives me words and pictures that I could not see before. The worms come out of the ground. And coming out of the ground, now I can look at that data and then that can fall away. That's stuff that I couldn't see. The point I'm making is the difference with the living inquiries is that it's getting into what's not conscious. It's not about just being with what is. Because often when you're being with what is, you don't actually see these things that are hiding the worms in the ground. So the inquiries are designed to pull those worms up, let those worms dissolve away. There's a deeper freedom in that. There's no end to the depth of this freedom, actually. The more you go into this skillfully. The Killaby inquiries are an entire set of tools, including like pretty good somatic tools. Like, for example, one thing that we came up with, which is really helpful for me personally, is when we have a contraction in the body. Now, what is a contraction? It's a word that points to the fact that our stomach feels like a tight fist sometimes, or our heart feels closed, or our throat feels throttled. That's a contraction, like emotion is sort of just stuck there. Sensation and emotion is just stuck there, and there's actually thoughts connected to it, Velcro to it, which keep these contractions there. So we learned how to go into the body, and one of the first developments was mining. So mining is when you're resting with a sensation or contraction that's, like say the heart is closed, you just start mining things out of that, things you can't see, like, so you might ask as you're resting with it and say, what does this sensation mean about me? And then here come the worms. Oh, it means that you're not good enough, that mom didn't love you, that whatever. And then as you see that data, and that data gets pulled out of the contraction, guess what happens? Is the contraction starts to change and often diminish and get smaller. You're seeing actually a transformation of that. That's one of the tools that we use because again, there's a Velcro effect mind-body connection. It's not just a sensation that's contracted in the body. It's actually, there's data in that, and you have to mine that data out. If you don't mine it out, that contraction just stays there in the heart. So big tool is the mining, but other tools were like, we started to realize, I gave talks years ago. I go around the country, England, different places. And I would say to people, look, when a feeling or a contraction comes up, just rest with it, meaning feel it and be present to it. And I realized that those words weren't really articulate enough because people would say, Scott, I've been resting and feeling this feeling for years. It's not going to do anything to just come down and feel this. I've been feeling it for years. And I say, no, you've actually been um, <laughs> sitting with Velcro, meaning you think you're sitting with a contraction or resting or feeling, but there's data there. So you've got to mine that out, right? But the other thing I noticed is when we say just feel it and let it be, that's often not enough for someone to really experience that because there's a resistance or a clinging to that contraction in the body, so to speak. So we learned how to work with that resistance by, for example, if someone feels a heart contraction, we would have them imagine two hands coming, coming up to hold that. Imaginary hands just holding that contraction and then dancing with it. Put my hands up here like so if the contraction gets bigger, the hands just go with it. And let it go bigger. If it gets smaller, the imaginary hands go with it. Why is that helpful? Very simple. Because there's already resistance to it. That's the nature of this. We're resisting something that doesn't feel comfortable. I don't like it. 
these these loving healing hands come and they just allow it to be and we call it the dance because if you watch on a dance floor a slow dance for example there has to be a leader and a follower if both people try to lead the dance it doesn't work same is true for the body if this you've got to let the sensation lead the dance and if there's resistance it that just creates more contraction the, the dance isn't working you know it's an awkward dance so by bringing these hands to it these hands somehow just allow it more like they're dancing with it they're not trying to control it or move it they're just following it wherever it goes and that's reducing resistance and clinging and then that can help let go of these contractions in the body that's part of the living or the, the kill being inquiries too somatic work you don't see a lot of that in some of the old teachings now i don't think that's a problem with the teachings i think that what happened is as we developed uh, through time and the western world came up we started to realize that um, the body is connected to the stuff there's a mind-body connection and there's trauma there we started to learn all these things uh, so the kill bee inquiries are trying really are, are, are developed to try to meet our experience more skillfully really and the inquiries are developing constantly just like the new model is developing constantly I guess the last thing I want to talk about is the end of your world. Adi Ashanti wrote a book called The End of Your World. And I meet a lot of people on the spiritual path who come to these places where it's like the wor their world is fighting to survive. The ego is fighting to survive and they're suffering. They get these experiences of presence and then they get pulled into certain stories. And I, one set of stories that I see is that as they start to become present, they start having these, the story like, well, I don't have a purpose anymore. Or what's the point of all this? And that's really just the ego. <laughs> that's your world trying to survive your ego. I just tell them, look, see, those are just thoughts too. You don't have to believe those. And as those fall away, the remnants of that ego will fall away they come more solidly into presence, right? That's one story that I see. see. Another story that I've seen or an experience that I've seen is where people have, so to speak, have been witnessing for so long that they've, they're stuck in awareness. Like, they're like there and that there's awareness here and everything else is out there and it's almost like another kind of duality and it feels very dry. That's the word that comes up feels very dry because they pulled back from everything so much and have identified so much with awareness there's just nothing to life there's no vibrancy there's no aliveness there's no love there's no nothing it's just nothing and as they come to me i tell them that's not the end of this like that's just a stage or a state that you're in and then what we have to do is we often have to go back to what they don't want to look at what they are avoiding in their experience whether it's trauma again drivers shame deficiency stories as we pull those things up they start to feel more they start to feel the stuff that they didn't want to feel the stuff the the feelings that that led them to wanting to wake up and be awareness so they don't have to feel that and that's where they get the dryness but as we start to inquire with them, they start to feel this stuff that's hidden in the body. They start to come alive more and they stop identifying so strongly with that dry awareness. That's another thing that happens. It's quite common, actually. I don't know if, if any of you out there are experiencing this. But I know some of you are because I have sessions with you. It might not be your experience now, but it may be your experience later. And as I talk about it, just talking about it may like plant a seed so that when you see that happening you won't get stuck there you'll be open to looking at that i haven't seen any questions here but i want to look i've seen some comments 
Let's see what we got here. 99% of our suffering comes from a self and there isn't one. Yeah. Thank you, Deborah. That's the exact, probably the exact quote. Um, yeah, these are all just comments. Nice comments, too. <laughs> I don't see any questions. Mm, is my mic going in and now? I apologize for that, if that's still happening. <laughs> Someone said, I love your face and eyes. Thank you. Hadn't seen you for, year, for years, and I love how you've aged. <laughs> Where's that may sound? You know, I'll tell you about aging. Um, I lost 30 pounds through the new model. I didn't even try to lose weight. What happened was, is I just went to the drivers. Because with my food addiction, I've been addicted to almost everything. That's why I speak about it so much. Um, I, I used to try to lose weight by having rules. <laughs> like, don't eat sugar. Don't eat carbs. All mindy stuff. Once I went to the drivers, the shame around eating, the deficiency stories, even trauma, my relationship to food just shifted. And it was just natural to eat differently. And then the weight just dropped. And so that's part of aging is I've lost weight. And people are like, how did you lose weight? It's like, without trying. I didn't try to lose weight. All I did is I did inquiry on the drivers. They were driving me towards the food in a compulsive way. Because when you work on the drivers, the compulsivity starts to fall away. You still might eat carbs or sugar, but there's no compulsion to keep eating it or binging on it. Because the binging and the compulsivity comes from the intensity of the drivers that are there. That's part of the aging process is that I've lost weight too. As I look back, and I see the incredible amount of chronic pain that I was in in the last three years. It reminds me of when I first got clean off drugs and alcohol because that was a really bad time in my 20s where I literally hit rock bottom. And I thought it was the, the end of my world, like in a bad way. I just didn't see any future, it was hopeless. And then yet yeah, that was such a blessing in disguise because that Rock bottom set me on a search, a spiritual search that led to freedom that I could never thought I would experience. Very grateful for that. I wasn't grateful for that when it was happening though. And I'll tell you the same thing is true of the pain. It's hard to be grateful for pain when you're being rushed to the emergency room and there's nerve energy going throughout your whole body and you literally wanna die. It's hard to be grateful. So there was a period of time where I couldn't find the gratitude for that. But as I started to sit with it and rest with it more, and I started to watch it fall away, the gratitude just came bubbling to the surface because it showed me so many things about how to come into the body skillfully and restfully. It taught me everything. It's a blessing. I couldn't feel that when it was happening, but it was a blessing. So I hope that you can see that the suffering that you're going through, if you are going through it, can seem overwhelming, like it's hopeless, there's no way out. But if you bring these inquiries to that suffering, you'll see that that's a blessing in disguise. Our suffering is the reason that we get free. Without suffering, we can't be free. Not two dualities that have to exist together, coexist, however you want to say that. The last thing I want to talk about is this thing, this line, the peace that passes all understanding. When I first read that, I thought, I have no idea. That sounds really good. <laughs> no idea what that's referring to. And the reason was is because I was trying to understand it with the mind. And yet the phrase itself said it's the peace that passes all understanding. Huh. That's quite a dilemma because the mind wants to understand what that means. But as I did inquiry and just lived in awareness and that conceptual, the conceptualization got quieter and quieter and the stories got quieter and quieter and there was just this presence. That's the piece that passes all understanding right there. 
Because there's no mind there. And even if mind arises, it's just like light data coming through. No Velcro. I mean, I do get triggered every now and then for sure. But mostly it's just light data coming through. And even so when the thoughts are arising, there's still that peace that passes all understanding because it's not connected to the Velcro emotions and sensations as much. Why? Because we developed inquiry to deal with that, to deal with that Velcro experience. So as you do these inquiries for a while, even thought doesn't pull you out of that peace. It passes all understanding, which is really nice because for a while thought seems to pull you out of it, right? It's like you have these moments of just being present. <sighs> and then you're pulled into some sort of suffering because of the Velcro. Because your body's sensations, emotions connected to the stories. And that's what makes them feel real. That's what makes you get pulled out of the piece, seemingly. But as you do the inquiries, disconnecting that Velcro, the thoughts come through again, and they're just not connected to that. So the thoughts don't disturb the peace. That's the beautiful thing. There's the peace when there's, there's no thought. And then there's peace when there's thought. Because the Velcro isn't there. Now, of course I get triggered every now and then. And the last thing I want to talk about, I think, is my partner, Chester, whom I love very dearly, deeply. Um, hmm. What I found is these kinds of relationships, the closer the relationship, the more grist for the mill. <laughs> it's like we're drawn to those who will bring up our stuff if we'll pay attention. And so I think in some cosmic way, it's like Chester and I came together and there was just such love and there is such love there, such a connection. At the same time, when there's that deep connection, that union, um, it often brings up the most vulnerable parts of ourselves. Like any fear of intimacy, jealousy, triggers, old deficiency stories. So if I get triggered every now and then, it would be with Chester, mostly mostly with him and it's so beautiful because it's like this relationship came together to show us both these things about ourselves and Chester did a lot of inquiry and has done a lot of inquiry with me and has seen how when we do get triggered with each other it becomes this perfect way to see what it is that's driving it like what am I believing over here that's making me attack you and what are you believing over there that's making you attack me and then in that chaos there's a peace that happens and then there's a reconnecting because the ego gets out of the way and love takes over again love's quiet revolution was the first book i wrote and that's still how i feel is that as we awaken love is having a revolution and love is so powerful i'm not just talking about romantic love i'm talking about unconditional love it's so powerful it's like a revolution in our consciousness and if we follow that and trust that rather than the ego amazing things can happen here on earth the the divisiveness can go away the terrorism the, a lot of the stuff that's scaring us and that's bad about the world can go away as love has its revolution Love cannot have its revolution as long as ego is running everything here on earth. We have to inquire into that ego for love to have its revolution. So if there's anything that I wish for 2021 and beyond is that love will have its revolution here on earth. Thank you guys for joining me. I wish that you could have joined me and talked to me, but this is the best we could do on New Year's Eve. Hope you have a wonderful night and a great 2021. See ya.